All right, you're very welcome along to this week's Shot Clock. It's time for another episode of the world's favourite sports debate show. We were supposed to have a referee this week, but he slept in. That's why there's only one presenter, Kieran. Can you believe it? <laughs> a carry on sleeping in. I kind of, I don't know what's going on. Oh, it, it sounds like a boycott, Joe. It sounds like a boycott more than a sleep in. He, but, got, uh, he got the message from the... Uh, Whoever the grand pooba is of the Kerry Mafia, here, listen, you, you need to be out there you, today. You had, you had a great substitute in Tommy to jump in, though, right? There you go. Yeah, always the best. Uh, look, <laughs> we, had a, we had a topic. We were going to start with Richie Hogan. We've got to start with Michal Donahue. He's somebody that you know very well because, obviously, you were in with the Galway Hurlers. A bit of a bombshell, the decision to leave because he was definitely somebody who you felt like had a full control over exactly what this uh, Galway team was capable of. He must have been looking at what Tipperary did from missing out on the uh, qualification for the All-Ireland series last year and winning an All-Ireland next year. And I'm sure that would have been the message going, look, Tip went from last to first. You guys have already been first. You know exactly what it takes. So were you surprised with the news broke last night? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, it was small, but I was talking. I talked to Michal yesterday. Um, you know, it's tough. It's 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 a it's a tough gig being a county manager of your own county because uh, you know there, there's there's constant kind of pressure on, especially when you when you've landed that all Ireland like Michal and the team did uh, two years ago. Um, there's that expectancy every year that you're going to come back with it, and as we know, the the hurling is ultra competitive. Uh, there's a number of teams that can come along and beat you. There's a number of teams that can win the All Ireland every year. Uh, we saw it this year. You know, we saw, uh, you know, a very fancy Limerick team uh, that when Kilkenny showed up on the day and, and showed their stuff. You know, they 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 came out the wrong side of a result. So, you know, but I I think Michal is is a big family man. He's got a young family. Um, they're getting into an age now where you know you have to be pretty hands on as a parent. So. I would say that that would be would have been a big factor in it, and you know it's 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 disappointing because I know the players and 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 the regard that they hold me all in. So um, you know I'd say there will be a lot of them disappointed this morning. But look, that's the way it is. We can't, you know, a, a, a man's his own man, and he's got to do what he's got to do for his family number one. And you know, especially when you've given it four years. Um, you know that's an awful lot of commitment in modern day stuff to 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 pour your life into it for four years. So that that that's what this story is here. There's no there's no smoking gun because he signed up for another two years. Um, I think either in the middle of the league campaign or before the league campaign got into the knockout stage. And certainly around that time, anyway, he'd he'd agreed to stay on. That like maybe it was always intention to leave after the year, and that's a good way of kind of kicking that can down the road. And so nobody asks you about it because it just kinda, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's the impression. That's the impression I would have got Jar off him when when he first contacted me last year about you know getting involved and uh, you know he said he kind of wanted to give it one last go and he wanted to leave no stone unturned and um, but on the kind of you know it was uh, on 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 the kind of shock exit the way it happened the the loss in Parnell Park then tied in with the 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 draw that you wouldn't kind of draws are hard to come by in hurling because scores are scored so easily. Um, you know, you wouldn't have felt that it was, you know, at that time I was kind of thinking, you know, it'll be tough to go on that. But look, he's 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 Galway number one. He's the Galway jersey number one at heart. And um, you know, maybe he felt with with everything that was going on at home with the family. Um, and 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 there's there's probably other there's probably other things I'm not privy to. But you know, the main thing I got out of him, out of him when he was talking to me yesterday was, you know, it's. The commitment levels with, with work and his family are, are an awful lot, and you know he f- really feels like he needs to be kind of giving it almost 150. percent There's no there's no middle ground with him. There's no kind of doing it and and putting other stuff first. Galway comes first. The hurling team comes first. All his players come first before everything else. And uh, yeah, when you've done that for four years, you know um, it can take its toll. And maybe you know maybe he decided in in, in the end and from talking to him that you know there was. There was other stuff that it, that that was more, you know, they had to look after. At, uh, you know, it's more critical, I suppose. And uh, when you when you have a young family and they're all kind of starting to go into secondary school and that, it's a very tricky time for to be around. So I'm sure he wants to be there for them because when you're obviously when you're an, uh, a county manager and you have a full time job like he does, um, you know, a young a young family can 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 you know be put to the side a small bit, uh, and it's not anybody's intentions. It's just the demands of the job when you have to watch and you have to trawl through video and you have to make all these phone calls and keep fellas going. And look, the players love me, Hall, and 
uh, they would have they would have done anything for him. So you know, but look, it'll be a chance for someone else to come in now, and a chance for all the players to to lay down their own markers as well. But um, you know, he was a great servant. What he did for for Galway, landing that title, there was memorable scenes, uh, and and probably very unlucky against Limerick last year in the final as well. So. And this year was 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 a bit of an out of nowhere kind of a, a shock to the system. I thought I felt that I felt that God, we were just starting to take. I think the win down in Nolan Park was 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 a great win, and um, yeah, we got you know we got the we got the soccer blow in Parnell Park, and then we we're going to the dressing room, going away to dust ourselves down for a quarter final, and then you hear the result is a draw, and next year sitting around the dressing room, and it's it was the worst kind of shock I've ever kind of received in a dressing room because it was it was on the way you were hearing that Kilkenny were up a pint, Wexford were up a pint and you were kind of hearing that this was all going on and just as we kind of got to the dressing room news filtered through that the game was actually a draw and that we were up and that Galway were out now at this stage so it was a very tough one to take um, you know and you know I was kind of hopeful after that 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 was so tough that he might might just get another year out of it to kind of you know uh, to see if he could if he could have that that that, that other shot at it, but look, he, you know he's made the decision on, on on them terms, and you know what? It's good to make it on your own terms in a way. Um, so you know it's 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 tough for for Galway hurling because I think he was he was very much appreciated by the fans, and he had a great uh, you know he had a great rep. You know, he had a great relationship with the fans up there. So, yeah, it is a tough one. Yeah, OK. All right, let's move on because we want to talk about some of the uh, other uh, issues this week from Shot Clock. Um, Richie Hogan's red. I think almost everybody is agreed that um, it was an unfortunate piece of timing from Richie Hogan, but that ultimately when contact is made with the head area, the referee, under the rules of the game, has no choice but to send the player off, Kieran. That's the rules. That's what has to happen, right? Um... Yeah, probably like that. They're the rules, but I think when it comes to all our finals, um, there's no next game, there's no, there's no tomorrow. And I think, you know, to be honest, when Richie was going in for the tackle, you know, you do that every time you go in for a shoulder. If you're running into shoulder somebody and they try to avoid you, that's the natural instinct just to make contact with them. You've made all the effort to get over there to stop them. Um, you know, if Richie comes in and, and, and throws an elbow in that kind of manner, absolutely, it's a straight red card. But I just felt in the spirit of the game, the spirit that Richie Hogan plays the game, you know, there wasn't a really a bad stroke. I didn't think Carl's Barrett's, you know, uh, hurlers do that when they're trying to flick the ball. They can't flick the ball, Jer, and stop their hurley automatically. It's, it's, a, it's, he it's heavy enough. When you swing it across, you know, he caught Richie on the face guard. It cut Richie on the nose. But Richie is the calmest player and, and the classiest player nearly to ever, one of the classiest players ever to Grey score packs when I was listening to him last night he said that yeah, he felt nothing about the tackle do you know what I mean that there was that there was no issues with it you saw the thump he got against Bill Cooper against Cork he got absolutely drilled he bounced up off the ground he never remonstrated with the player he never remonstrated with the referee he just got up and jogged back into his position after getting an absolutely uh, merciful thump so you know I just think in, a, in an all Ireland final at the speed these guys are going with everything that's on the line um, technically, it was a red card by the rules of the book, but I think in this kind of a situation, early in the game, you know, I think you can look at it and, and give a yellow card. You're not going to get in trouble for a yellow card for it. I think it does is better for the game. You know, let's call a spade a spade. It spoils the game. We're all sitting at home watching the All Ireland final, and you're kind of going, "Jesus, this is spoils the game." Um, so, like, you know, just in that, you know, in that but instance, does, does, I would... But does, does, does the spoil game matter? It's so, if he got, if he led with the elbow, it would have been a red card, the game would have been spoiled. Yeah, if he led with the elbow, but he didn't lead with the elbow. He went to shoulder him. Uh, Kyle Barrett, by his own, won't disagree with me on this, isn't a big man. So, he's low already. Richie isn't a big man. So, they're two, they're two kind of smaller fellas going at full tilt, you know, to try and, to try and win a ball back for Kilkenny. And... I just don't think... I think there has to be malice for a red card in my eyes. I don't know if that... You know, there has to be malice behind something for a red card. You know, I don't think there was any malice in that. Um, you know, I, 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 I've seen enough red cards and most of them, there's a bit of malice in them, but there honestly was no malice in this. This was a fella going to drill a guy out over the sideline to get the Kilkenny crowd going and, and try and help his team win an all Ireland final. And you even saw by his reaction, he was never expecting a red... I know, in fairness to the ref, he did consult with people. He did take his time in the call. So, look, it's, it's, it's a call that has to be made. 
I just think going forward, when you're at that stage in an All Ireland final, um, and there's no real malice in the challenge, you know, I think there's common sense. I think there's a bit of common sense can come into it and kind of go, look, it was just he just mistimed it. You know, Carl Barrett got up and played the rest of the game. He 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 had a powerful game after that, so it wasn't something like he took a guy out of it and you're meant to be carried off. Um, so yeah, look, I uh, you know. I know Richie, and there isn't this bad streak in him, um, and he plays the game the right way. And I just thought in that instance, you know, 28 minutes into the game, that the ref could maybe look at it and, and, and give a yellow and give a firm talking to Richie and say, Richie, one more bad tackle, you're gone. I think that wouldn't affect it much. Uh, Tipperary probably would have still won the game. They were probably the better team all year. But I think we would have got a much better, you know, game. It, it was a game that was robbed by that incident, and I think... Possibly you could do a bit of common sense in a jar. All right, that's uh, certainly one point. Uh, here is Richie Hogan speaking last night. If anybody missed it, just to bring you right back up to speed, here is his reaction to being sent off. This is exactly what he said. I, I, I watched it back there. Um, uh, this morning, obviously, I stayed away from it earlier on, but I mean, I, I was going in for a shoulder on Carl Barrett, and he sidestepped inside, and my men momentum kind of took me through. Um, in my opinion, there's no... There's absolutely no way it was a sending off, but um, I suppose that's the way it, that's the way these things go. I mean, um, sometimes those decisions go for you, and sometimes they go against. And um, yeah, it was one of those one of those things for me. All right, so our next uh, our next topic this morning is about the issue of tax breaks for GA players. Karen, what's your what's your plan here? <laughs> I'm retired, Jer, so I can't be I can't, I can't be. That this is myself, but no, I was reading Carl Barrett's piece the weekend, and you know, there's there's such an industry in the GEA. Yes, it's amateur and it's a great organisation, and it brings people together all over the world, and it is fantastic, and we know all that. But what we're saying is is that players um, of all levels at senior at senior grade, you know, come together. They're probably coming together September, October have that first meeting and to start training through the winter and to build it into the league and to you're basically 10 or 11 months you're 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 putting you know 20 to 30 hours a week into this and a lot of people have to take time away from work uh Jarrah. and gone be the days where you get the i got the job i got the soft job in the bank jar back in the day when i was breaking into the Kerry team as a young starlet i got the soft job but i quickly realized the days of the soft jobs were gone you know i had a you know, I, I, I had a manager that was, was was that was raised in England that had no real, you know, uh, you know, there was no wasn't, GEA. Wasn't taking any of your crap, basically. That was it. it, exa it exactly, yeah. It wasn't like, I think 20 or 30 years ago, fellas got the job in the bank and they were mighty men. They could go off playing golf and they could pat fellas in the back and bring in the few bob every week and everything would be okay. But them days are gone. So there's no, players are getting no breaks now. The player, the industry is too busy. It's work. You got to do your job. You got to deliver on your job. But then you're trying to deliver for a Kerry or a Mayo as well. You know, Chris Barrett's average week. He's getting into the car at at three o'clock on a Tuesday, driving all the way to 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 train over in Mayo on a on, on getting a lift over on a bus. He's trying to work on the way over on the bus. He trains. They have a meeting. He eats his dinner. He gets home at at twelve one o'clock in the morning. He's back in the office the next morning at seven o'clock because he's had to leave early the day before. So that's a that's grand in a week, but when you're trying to deal with that, along with the pressures of representing your county, of trying to fulfil your potential as a player, as a team, you're playing these massive games in Crow Park, you're playing a massive All Ireland finals. You know, it's it's he's doing it a long time. You know, the the Cluxtons, and I said this a long time ago, the Cluxtons and the and the Mark O'Shea's, the guys that are, Tomas that are up around 88, 90 championship games, they're just not going to be around anymore because fellas can't give it that much. You know. Steve, Stephen's a teacher, I believe. It's a bit easier. Mark was a teacher. Tomas was a teacher. They have the summer off. It's a bit easier to do it. But when you're trying to do all this, you're throwing a young family into the mix and you're trying to represent your county and the only incentive is there is to win the All-Ireland because everything else is a failure for any of the top teams. But we've got an instance. I was down in Finbars with off the ball and doing a road, <coughs> a road show a few months ago and I found out for the first time that the girls... The ladies footballs, footballers and camogie players don't even get mileage. Um, they pay their own way to go to training. So we're, 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 we're filling Crow Park with concerts, with big games. There's massive revenue coming in. And I just think there could be, you know, some tie-in between the Crow Park and the, the, the tax office or, you know, the revenue and kind of say, listen, lads, is there something we can do for amateur players here that, 
you know, Kyle was talking about uh, it's a tax, uh, it's a, a professional sports person's tax relief. We're not professionals, but if you told Kyle Barrett he wasn't a professional after all the training he put in, or if you told any of the, the female Dublin footballers or the female Cork footballers that they weren't professional with all the effort they're putting in, they'd be highly insulted with you, Jar. And the, 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 the thing reads, a professional sports person can claim a tax deduction of 40% against gross receipts for up to 10 years during their career. You know, if that's that'd be a nice incentive. What, what would that What would that mean for the average GA player? Probably that when he finishes a play, he might get enough to maybe put a deposit in the house for himself. We have GA players that are going to college for eight and nine years because they can live the professional life of, of a sports person. But at the end of the day, they're not making revenue for themselves. If they get a bad injury and they have to retire, they have no financial standing to go buy a house. So I just think there needs to be something done. And I think I agree with Chris Barrett and. And and uh, that's my thoughts. I don't know if you have any counter thoughts. In well, the chart. I, I just think that this isn't for the tax man to solve. This is for the GEA to solve. Because if you, you know, yeah. if, you know we're talking about um, American college sport all the time and it's always, oh, the colleges are making all this money. No one thinks that the US government should step in and pay the basketballers or the college footballers who are making all the money for the colleges. Everybody thinks the college should pay the players who are generating the revenue. So if there's a belief from the players that they need to be paid for what they're doing, it shouldn't be the tax man who pays. It should be the GAA. Yeah, but what about the, what about the income the players bring to Dublin every weekend, Jar? What about the, the income players bring? Are you saying that there's no input from players to the tax man when every fella's buying his pint to get us over to Crow Park Hotel? I, like, what what has that got to do with the tax man, though? Because so, if that's the case, then every concert promoter in the country, the Electric Picnic Festival organisers, they need a tax well, rebate because yeah, they're but I, did, I didn't. I didn't say it was all the tax. I'm saying there has to be some tie-in with GEA, with what the players are bringing to the economy on a weekly basis or on a yearly basis. But who who makes the most? The who makes the most? The GEA makes the most, right? They're the ones who... Yeah. It was 90 quid a ticket and 7 quid for a, a programme at the weekend for the All-Ireland Final. The stadium's full and there's the whole middle tier that are paying more than that for their tickets. So, what was it, yeah. 6, 7 million in revenue from that one game? 6, 7 it's million five, revenue? Five, it's, five, it's 500 euros a room for a night in Dublin for Kerry people going up in a few weeks, sir. <laughs> yeah, and look, that and that's price gouging and that's a, a terrible aspect of Irish life where we're just, we just gouge whenever we possibly can, whenever there's an opportunity to. But I think that the GAA could clearly deal with this issue somewhere along the way if the players decided that they wanted to go. But the players are always like, oh, we don't want to go professional. You no, know. but I, I, this is nothing to do with professional. This is just <clears> so you can you can play your game, you can put all the effort in, and you can tell your wife who's at home with your two kids every day, look, listen, Pet, when I retire in two years, there's going to be a bit of a kickback here for all the effort and and and, and what, I put in, what we put into the game. And I just think both for male and female at senior level in both codes, you know, that if there was a bit of a kickback or whether the GEA did it, I, I I remember we talked about it in Shot Clock months ago, even if there was something like, you know, if there was five grand for every five years you played. So if you, you know, something small like that, I'm not talking profession. I'm not talking money. I'm talking about when a fella retires that he can, everything he's put on hold and all the extra overtime he's turned down and all the time he's missed that he got deducted for from work that there was something there for him to fall back on when he goes to try and buy a house for his young family. That's, or, 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 or uh, you know, whoever it is going and buying a house. Um, I just think there could be more done for the players on that side of it. We don't want to be professional. We never want money. We don't expect the GEA to pay money. But if there was some kind of a tie in here, I think it would be no harm. All right. Uh, two quick things. Is it, is it much better to try and get people educated at the age of 15 that if you're going to have a GEA career, you need to... You also need to look after your own proper career so that you, you aren't somebody who's always constantly turning down over time. You find something suitable for your skills that you can do, uh, you know, either That's at home a good or point. spare time and, and massively point. invest in that so that it's done with the county boards and with the GPA combined. Yeah, it's all well and good, Joe, but the game is only going one way on a professional level and it's skyrocketing towards the demands on players are big. And what are you doing? Oh, I, I, sorry, uh, James Horan, I can't come to training because I have double overtime this evening and I'm getting paid an extra 400 quid, but I need to turn it down because we've rent to pay or we've a mortgage to pay. You know, you don't belong being dropped off your team, going down the pecking order, and then what's it all about? So I don't think you're ever going to get guys, guys are going to give it everything and give it all the commitment. They're going to be in the gym three mornings a week at six o'clock before work. They're going to be commuting to training. They're going to be away all weekend. It's you're not going to stop players doing that. So uh, it's only it, that's only going to get worse. By the way, as as teams try and 
compete with the with the Dublins of this world. Okay, let's move on. Next issue is trolls and racists. This is on the back of the uh, horrific racial abuse that Paul Pogba has suffered on Twitter this week. What's your take on all this, Kieran? Ah, oh, it's it's look, it's sickening. Um, it's a disgrace. But like you know, we're 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 we've keyboard warriors everywhere, and you know I've got my fair share of them over the years. These are adults in Ireland that could have kids. I don't know, but you know some of the stuff they say to you, um, you'll be just scratching your head, really. And you know what drives me simple altogether are these fake accounts where these cowards don't even put their name to the text or put their name to their message they're sending you or whatever they're at, whatever they're adding you on. It's it's. It's a sickening culture that's there, um, and yeah, I do, like. I don't know, Jerry. You're a lot smarter than me. Surely, bit of God, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and these people can come up, can come together and come up to help that because this is a sporting thing and this is Paul Pogba, but this comes down to your 14 year old child who's getting it off a group of friends yeah. who are bullying her online because that's what it is. It's a term. Of, it's a form of bullying. But yet we do it on a daily basis in Ireland. People will say this about premiership players. They'll say this about GEA players. They'll say this about rugby players. And they'll put it up on their thing and, oh, I'm having a go and I don't like this guy or whatever. But at the end of the day, if their children are looking at it, they, they say, oh, this is OK. We can say what we want about people here. Uh, there's an old saying, if you've nothing good to say, say nothing at all. And uh, yeah, it is just, it's, it's you know, even WhatsApp groups, I see them, a lot of them are toxic after a game, slating people. You know, I, I, you know, I'm my family WhatsApp now really is in and and team WhatsApps are about all I want to be on because you know everything else is a slating game. It's 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 you know I, uh, for for the social for the for the social media channels, you're how they can come together and that when someone goes to open an account or send a letter out to everybody that has an account and look for them to send in their ID to verify their account. Um, I can't understand how something like that can't be done, but maybe I'm naive to the point of that there's way too much to it, but maybe you might enlighten me on what could be done to stop this, because we're going to have to stop it, Jar. Like, it's going to go to the point where, you know, people aren't able to take stuff. Like, I'm a big boy, I'm able to take all that stuff, but, you know, I wouldn't fancy my, my daughter in, in 10 years getting the same treatment, to be quite honest with you. If you, if you try and open um, an online gambling account, they tie yeah. it to a credit card and they ask you for, now they ask you if you want to, ever want to withdraw money, uh, you need to put a utility bill and some uh, ID. The trouble is that all of these um, organisations that we're talking about have millions and millions and millions of anonymous accounts. So you would have to close them down and suddenly the figures that you've reported as your user base are massively inflated and everybody begins to see it. The emperor has no clothes, basically. Uh, yes. So the, the anonymous accounts help profit lines and while that continues to happen they're going to pretend that they're doing something about it as opposed to just saying no more anonymous accounts no accounts with without yeah. a photograph and uh, no accounts without like a, a verified two-step email address yeah but on the back of the paul pogba and marcus rashford and united they're a big club um you know don't it, like could they do anything as in boycotting these things or 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 trying to create enough that get maybe all the premiership teams together, get sporting organisations together and say, listen, we're going to tell our sports stars to to come off this for a, an amount of time until you get your shit together and yeah. fix what's going on here. Well, could, if, is, is there something that could be orchestrated like that, I wonder? If LeBron... A, a world closure Twitter account day or something? If LeBron and Pogba got together and decided that they were going to come off social media for 15 days, then the profit line at all of those organisations, on Instagram, on Twitter... Whatever, whatever their one of choice is, would okay. immediately be impacted. So they do have some power, and they just need to start wielding it. And the clubs need to get behind them as well to do the same thing. And then you need the Premier League to say, okay. "We're going to shut we, down we, everything, every related tweet to us. We're going to issue copyright against un unless there's some deal done." Yeah, that's that sounds good, Jar. We'll, we'll we'll send LeBron and uh, Pogba the shot clock episode. There you go. Yeah. To talk to, <laughs> talk like to their employer. Talk to their employers. <laughs> We wanted to talk about backroom teams, um, the, the Sheedy effect or the backroom team effect. Uh, it was pointed out that they have a second bus, Cyril Farrell mentioned it this morning, to carry the backroom team for Tipperary. I think it was 27 or 28, one of the lads said there was. There's like individual um, goalkeeper, backs, forwards, a bunch of different strength and conditioning, a bunch of nutritionists. It's a, it's a massive, massive game now, but you can see the impact of it on the field of play as well. And yet, 
Eamon O'Shea is the one that everybody talks about creating the space and the, the magic that that team had. So what's the truth? What one tip the All-Ireland? Is it the money for the backroom team? Is it the individuals? How does this work? Yeah, I think it's probably a bit of a bit of everything. Um, I think, first of all, you have to have someone that pulls it all together. And, and Sheedy has been unbelievable this year in, in that respect. Since day one, he's had Tipperary flying. If you remember them in the league, they were scintillating. In Monster Championship, they flew through everything. They had a bit of a blip in the final. Uh, and since then, you know, they were they were they were they put on a, an awesome show alone last week, granted against the fourteen man Kilkenny, but you know, they were going to win it. They were going to win it anyway. I think they were they had that confidence level built up all year. And as you said, you know, the the I think managers are very important, but managers will be the first people to tell you that they pick the team and they send you out there and really it's the players that win you or lose you the or when the players win, when the team wins, it's always the players who won the game. They were brilliant. But when the team loses, it's always the manager that lost the game. And I just think um, you know, in my eyes, the day the selector is gone. Yeah, there. Like, tell us about tell us about this because this is something that you uh, think is important. Yeah, I think it is because I think it. You know, I think it all. First of all, when it all falls in the manager, it's wrong. When 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 you have a number of guys in a backroom team and they're all driving, they all should be held to some kind of regard. And I think this kind of selector thing was an old fashioned thing. Oh, he's there to pick the team. There's no such thing. No, I would say Eamon O'Shea is the offensive coordinator for Tipperary. That's a big. That's a tag in the, in the, in the. You know, you'll have assistant coaches in America will have certain tags after their name. Um, you know, Darry Egan, who we we built a pitch with him at PST over in Kiladang, and, and I met him three years ago. He wasn't involved then, in, but I got straight away as like, geez, this fella is so sharp when it comes to sports and teams. We were, ta- I was still playing with Kerry at the time. We we're talking about Kerry. He was talking about Tip Hurling. Uh, obviously, you know. Um, uh, Tommy Dunn obviously is well involved and then you go to your strength guys your nutrition guys and all that but I think your management team you know you should have your manager you should have your fella that looks after the, the offensive side of the game uh, probably like a Jason Sherlock for Dublin would do a lot of work with the forwards then you might have a defensive kind of guy a coordinator that looks after uh, you know a puck out or a kick out uh, strategist now is huge in the game the, the game is based around possession so I think having somebody that can you know, uh, utilize the spacing of pitches and and creating space and getting somebody to win constant possession from your own kickouts or puckouts is massive. Um, and yeah, just the selector thing is too vague for me anymore. And I think we should, you know, it it almost empower those guys more. But at the same time, if if the forward function doesn't work in a big game. You know, it's not just the managers then, you know, all of a sudden, hold on, no, Eamon O'Shea was the offensive coordinator, or, you know, what was he doing in the whole thing? I think it, I think the, the manager, and I'm sure Michal who would probably, you know, back this up, the axe falls on the manager's neck when the team loses and goes out, and that's the way it is, but, you know, it, it does, the, the other guys are putting away too much into it these days, first of all, to kind of just say they're other oh, selector, that's, you know, there's a way more in inter-county management now, in backroom teams. And I just think Liam Sheedy, I think he got the backroom team right. And it's a huge thing going forward for teams, Jer. You know, your manager yeah. is critical. I get that. But, you know, you got to surround yourself as a manager. you got to surround yourselves with very sharp guys that know what they're about. And that's what Liam Sheedy did. And the proof was in the pudding in Crow Park uh, last Sunday. All right. Our guest this week is Martin Conroy. He's the uh, coach of the Irish under-20 basketball team. Martin, good morning to you. How are you doing? Morning, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm very good. Uh, Kieran is uh, doing his best to get the whole country interested in, <laughs> in basketball, and he's doing a great job of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was watching the, the bit of the podcast last week there while we were in Kosovo, so it was uh, great to hear a, a bit of basketball. Great, uh, Kieran. Tell us about Martin. What's going on? Ah, uh, look. I suppose firstly, Martin. Thanks for coming on Shot Clock, and and thanks for taking the call. Uh, no firstly, look. Just congrats on the success. Um, you know, beating Team GB in the in the bronze medal game, going up to Division A two years after making history with your under 18s in Dublin two years ago. There must have been this massive buzz at, on the final buzzer. Yeah, absolutely. Like it was, um, it was a fellow Kerry man actually, Tommy O'Mahony had the girls when they were under 18, and the ones yeah, that's right. Medal, they they lost to to Germany in the in the final in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, the other day, I suppose after coming off the back of the semi-final defeat to Bulgaria which was a pretty tough game for us and to go back out and do what we did on the Sunday then in the final in the in the bronze medal final against GB was fantastic you know we we had some great basketball uh, first quarter we were 22-5 up at one stage and up 22-7 yeah it was pretty it was pretty exciting stuff 
pretty exciting stuff. And that's that's it's some achievement considering the last team last time an under twenty uh, team won a game was almost eleven years ago, and it was Tralee's very own Hall of Fame where Jimmy Diggins was the coach that time. So to, that's the last time an under twenties team has won a game to 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 beaten. Team GB and and going up to Division A next year is is massive. It's a massive step in in for the program and Irish basketball in general. Yeah, definitely. Like I mean, it wasn't just like we, we beat Croatia on the way as well. We topped. Both yeah, it's pools, huge. Which was fantastic. That's uh, Croatian national twice. sport. Yeah, absolutely. Like I mean, the, these girls have done a lot for basketball, especially women's basketball. And like I mean, they're. They're phenomenal athletes, but they're a phenomenal team as well. They, like the unity is is unbelievable. There was nine girls from the 2017 squad on this squad, and like they just pulled together so well. And been around them for the ten days and seeing how they act with each other was just amazing. Yeah, and been around them for. T- I, I saw they were like the, the they were like the Spurs under Popovich at one stage. They popped the ball around about <laughs> 19 passes and uh, and picked out Claire Mealy, I think under the basket for one of the highlights of the tournament, but. You know, this team has brought new levels of success uh, to Irish basketball that are unheralded, really. It's the largest indoor sport, obviously, played in the country. These girls work hard. We've talked about it. They're training every weekend since April. They go on a Friday night. They do a three-hour session. They have a six-hour session on a Saturday. They have another three-hour session, plus video, plus a game on a Sunday. And they all go back home. They drive home. That's some commitment to the Irish jersey. Um what kind of funding or support are you getting to keep this going, Matt? Uh, the girls themselves would have paid a lot of the money towards it. We did some fundraising. We we got some sponsorship in as well. Uh, we did a golf classic and a, and a, a race night up in Port Leash Golf Club and kind of earned a few bob that way. And you're, you're kind of throwing buckets out on the doors for any practice games you have and hopefully getting a few bob in that way. But... You know, the, the, unfortunately, with the way the programs are, I suppose, and it's not just the girls' program, it's every program, uh, funding is, is kind of an issue, but it, it's getting better as, it, as it's going along. Uh, it's just unfortunate that kids have to pay to, to represent their country, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, okay. And and is there any, it, 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 Basketball Ireland do their best for you. Is there any, does there, is there anything coming from anywhere else? Um, or is it all kind of self-funded for, for these teams? No, it's, it's self-funded at the moment. Um, it's like some of the, the teams go out and, and get their own sponsorship. I see that uh, Paul Keller is under 18 boys got a, a very good sponsorship deal there with uh, Frank and Honest uh, Coffee Company. Um, okay. I think Michael Lynch did the same up in up in Galway with uh, I think it was Aaron Aaron or Aaron. Um, okay. Like there, you can go and get sponsors. The, the, the tough thing at the moment is to attract the sponsor. Uh, I suppose with these yeah, girls. but the social the social media coverage you're getting, um, and I know Garrett Maguire's daughter Erin had that cheeky off the back pass against Croatia. Um, I'm sure that would have sickened the Croatian national <laughs> nationals uh, people who, who who treat basketball as their national sport to see a young Irish girl pull that move off and then finish the layup and get the two points. Um, you know, them them that type of thing that that got massive coverage in Ireland. So. Obviously, a sponsor that was involved in the team would, would make hay after something like that. Absolutely, 100%. And it wasn't just in Ireland. I mean, like, I saw the FIBA website afterwards, and yeah. it, kind of, it blew up, you know, when, when Enya did that. And, and like, it was, um, it, it, that's, that's huge. Like, I mean, things like that. Surely, when sponsors see that there's 15, 20,000 hits on just one play, you know, that, that that's a carrot for them to go and say, yeah, well, you know, this is maybe something we can get involved in, you know. Um, yeah, and 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 like you know, it's look, it's it's performance, and that's all you want when you train that hard all summer for your team. You know, going over there winning is, is all you want, and that's that's huge. But come here to me, it was an unbelievable squad. I watched a, a lot of the games; they seem to be really in tune with each other. But just two girls in particular, uh, along with Enya Maguire after that play, but Claire Melia and and uh, uh, Dana Finn, they were outstanding throughout the tournament. Yeah, like as I said to you earlier, like they were a fantastic team. Obviously, Claire's efficiency was off the charts. She was the most efficient player in the tournament at twenty five point two. But mm-hmm. like what she what she did during the the week was phenomenal. And you know she's been doing that for a long time now. Dana Finn, the same thing. Like she's an unbelievable athlete. Uh, gets out running the floor and does some things on the floor that you don't think are actually possible at times. Like you, as a coach and even as a basketball person, you kind of shake your head as. 
to how the ball goes in the basket, but she makes it happen and does it time after time. But there is, and what's you know, the future? What's the future for these girls, Martin? Uh, Claire is heading away to the states. She's going. I think it's the twenty fifth of this month. She's going to St. Joe's in Philadelphia. Uh, Whoa, okay. She's going to be playing D one basketball, and of course, her own Susan Moran is over there as one of the associate yeah. coaches. Um, so that's she a looks, big she step up for Claire. For her, no doubt. And she, she's looking forward to that challenge. Uh, Dana is away in Erasmus, going to Spain, I think, in September for the year as part of her college course. Okay. Most of the other girls are, are going to be in college in Ireland for you know for the next two years or so, and, and then they're looking at their their kind of careers outside of basketball and outside of school after that. Well, hopefully they all end up uh, playing for the senior team. Uh, Martin, congratulations! It's exactly. a great story, and hopefully you get a bit of sponsorship as well. Um, if if anybody out there has any spare money and wants to celebrate uh, one of the best <laughs> the Irish success stories, we'll uh, we'll put them in touch with you, Martin. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Thanks, Thank, sure. thanks, thanks Martin. Sure. No matter. Um, just one quick point before we get on to our predictions, and we're way over time here, Kieran. It's 8.52 this morning. Um, you've been calling for Kerry fans to get their colours up, according to our former colleague, Jerry O'Sullivan of Radio Kerry. He says, following the call from Matt Starry, boy 14, to show your colours, Ken Mayer puts up the green and gold in the All-Ireland Final. What's going on? Are you, are you cheating on us with Radio Kerry? Uh, I might be doing a bit of cheating on you, John. <laughs> No, nah, man, it's, yeah, look, I remember as a player, my first All-Ireland uh, uh, as a player was, um, was when I was playing on the team was obviously 2006. Uh, I was there in 2005, but when you're not playing or you're not you're not fully kind of out there all the time, it's it, it, it's it's not overly the same. It's a bit more now with, with the squad game the way it's played. But I was well down in the squad in 2005. I was an unused sub in that All Ireland final. But I remember 2006 and the running momentum that Kerry were on. You know, if you if you take how bad we were blowing the Munster final, and then you you beat Longford, and then you beat this unbelievable Armagh team, then you beat Cork again, and then you'd Mayo shocking Dublin on the other side, and they were coming for another crack at us after 2004, and it was just a build up in Kerry that kind of it was it it, 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 it just got you going. There was flags everywhere. There was flags out in gardens, up in walls, hanging off of trees, hanging out of windows of shops. The towns were covered in green and gold. And it just gave me a, a sense of a player that, Jesus, like I'm representing more than my team here and my family. Like, you know, I'm representing every single one of these people. And yeah, I was driving through uh, Killarney and, and a few other places there uh, last week. And I was just kind of, you know, you wouldn't know there was an All-Ireland band. There was no buzz. There was no flags. And I kind of said, Jesus, our lads are going up to try and stop this juggernaut that is Dublin going for five in a row. Like, I was thinking, are people afraid, or did they want to put out their flag, or or, or they just haven't got it yet, or or are we just all too busy, Jar? Because we're living in a modern world and everybody's very busy all the yeah. time. But you know, uh, you know, flags out can give a team a sense of pride, a place. So it's it's the players wouldn't even notice it, but I would say subconsciously you're you're soaking all this in. You, yeah, you're seeing how much it means to everybody, and, and yeah, you, you I, I actually. <laughs> Yeah, I did notice it, and I put up a message kind of going, and I was going to be a biggest hypocrite of all time, and I was going to put up a tweet kind of going, lads, get the colours up, the towns are a joke, and then I realised I'd no flag up outside my own house. <laughs> so I went, I, went into, I went into Hennebury Sports, and I bought my flag when I was, it's down the road from the bank I used to work in, I was in the bank the same day, so I popped down, got the, got the flag, took it out home, proud as punch, took the two girls out, Lola Rose and Indy, hung up the flag, um, and then I could slate everybody else for not having their flags up so yeah no but it was just a little reminder to myself that hey you know yeah uh, uh this is important for these boys and just on that your um this this jersey i'm wearing for the hpv vaccine it's uh uh, uh laura brennan she lost her she lost her life and for the last 18 months of her life she campaigned to have this on and and they sent a number of jerseys around to uh to, to sports people just to, to highlight you know the, the awareness around the vaccine um, that's effective and that has been proved to be safe so uh, Laura didn't get the chance to, to fulfil her her message to people but um, I think our family have done her very proud by getting all of these sports people around Ireland to wear uh, jerseys like these and really good jerseys put the stacks colours and everything on it and uh, to help just raise awareness for that vaccine. So I just said I'd give that a, a, a special shout out and shot clock this morning. Yeah, no, fair play to you and uh, wholeheartedly endorse that view as well. Um, one word predictions for the games of the weekend. The Ladies Semi, Cork against Dublin. Oh. <laughs> uh, one, one word. 
Du Dublin. Yeah, okay, I'm going with Dublin as well. Norwich against Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea are going. I, I was impressed with Chelsea last week. We were a bit unlucky. We ran out of steam small, but I'll go with Chelsea in that. And I'll go for a draw in Arsenal and Spurs before you get to before me. So. Grand, okay. I'm going to go for um, I'm going to go for a draw in Norwich against Chelsea. I think we're still a bit away ah, from Chelsea's first win. It's Liverpool, 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 Liverpool against Arsenal. I think Liverpool are going to beat Arsenal. You're going to go for a draw on that it's one? It's it, Tottenham and Arsenal, isn't it? Ah, or right. Liverpool, Arsenal. Yeah. Is it Liverpool, Arsenal? That's what, that's what it says here. All yeah. right, Joe, kill, Joe killed me with that. Yeah, right, I'll, I'll go over the draw either way. All right, okay. <laughs> On that note, shot clock is over. Another one in the books. Kieran, enjoy the week. Talk to you again soon. Th th thanks, Joe. Okay, bye. It's uh, Kieran Donnelly this week's shot clock.